I'm going to talk to you today about neoclassicism. This is a style that begins in France uh, in the 1780s and would have uh, would extend into the 19th century and have uh, have a considerable impact on later painters. Um, uh, the term classicism used here might be confusing because we we've, we've used this term again and again. So let's go kind of back up and figure out what this means. Um, the classical style, of course, originated in antiquity with the Greeks uh, and their, their successors, the Romans. And it refers to uh, a style that um, tends to idealize the human figure and to uh, adhere to values of clarity, simplicity, moderation, restraint. Uh, the classical style was then revived in the Renaissance. So we could use the term Renaissance classicism. Uh, this is seen perhaps most clearly in the art of Raphael, but, but many other artists of that time period. Uh, and, uh, and so um, uh, uh, an important aspect of the rebirth of interest in uh, the culture of antiquity that takes place during the Renaissance is a um, is a return to the classical ideals of the art of that time. And particularly works of sculpture that survived from the time of the Greeks and Romans were taken as models to be studied, to be emulated in, in um, newly made works of art. Uh, classicism is also seen within the Baroque period, particularly in the art of Nicholas Poussin. Um, Anibale Karachi would be another, another um, example. And so we, we can speak of Baroque classicism. But the practice of art wandered quite far from those ideals in the early uh, 18th century, as we've seen in the Rococo style, which is, um, uh, which adheres to a very different um, representation of the human figure. The figures in Watteau's works are, are very thin and, and rather insubstantial, tiny, hands and feet and, and heads. Uh, the subject matter tends to be light um, and um, amorous, even erotic. And the paintings are just full of things. Uh, and so um, they, they don't um, they have little to do with the, the restraint, the simplicity, the clarity that, um, uh, that, that uh, one sees in, 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 uh, in, in classicism in its various manifestations. But by the end of the 18th century, there was then a return to the classical ideals of those previous periods. And so we call this period, this, this, this style, neoclassicism, new classicism. Let's take a look at some works. One of the first works I'm gonna show you is by a woman painter. Uh, her name was Angelica Kaufman. Um, and I believe this is the first woman painter whose work we've looked at all semester. Um, really for lack of time. There are certainly others we might have considered, but they tend to be rather few in number um, until the, um, the 19th and especially the 20th century. Uh, this work is entitled uh, Cornelia, Mother of the Gracchi, pointing to her children as her treasures. And it dates from around 1785. So the subject is a, is a serious one. Uh, it comes from the, uh, the history of ancient Rome. The Gracchi, that is the boys over here, uh, when they grew up, they, um, they had consequential roles in the, in the political history of Rome. And you can see that the, this, the, the smallest little boy holds a, um, a scroll. And so this would refer to writing and um, uh, political leadership. Well, what's happening here is that um, the mother of Cordelia, uh, the mother of the Gracchi, is entertaining a visitor who sits down and she is showing her jewels, her own jewels as her treasures. And you can see that she is uh, somewhat more elaborately dressed. Um, and she seems to be asking Cordelia, um, what are her treasures? And, and Cordelia, instead of showing uh, her material things points to her sons. 
it, it's interesting she points not to her daughter, whose hand she holds, and who seems interested in the jewels, but to her sons. So the rather traditional values here uh, of um, the, the greater importance of sons and um, their, their more active, consequential role in the world is, is upheld in this painting, though it's done by a woman painter. But to notice, in contrast to works in the Rococo style, I will refer to an extreme example here in Fragonard's painting of the swing, um, a painting with a rather frivolous, licentious subject. Uh, Kaufman's painting is spare. Um, we see the simplest of architectural settings and a view through an opening into a landscape of great simplicity as well. Uh, what we see in the background is a single column and a single pier. And I think the choice of these two uh, architectural forms is significant. The column appears behind the visitor who, who sh shows off her jewels. And you notice that the column, the contour of the column aligns with the axis of her body. Uh, now, columns are much more expensive to, to produce, to carve, than is a pier, which can be made up of rectangular blocks uh, blocks of stone which are quarried in that rectangular form and thus have to be rather little modified to be put together into a pier. Um, the, the, the figures of uh, Cornelia and the boys are located uh, strategically in relation to that pier. You notice that the contour of the pier, the edge of the pier, runs right down the axis of Cornelia's body and aligns with a fold and a shadow in her drapery. And likewise, the other side of the pier aligns with the, the axis of the body of one of the, the Grocky boys. So this is a painting that has a serious message. It aims to teach, to educate, to instruct, and how different this is in, in really every way in style and subject and meaning from the Rococo example that I showed you and, and the Rococo paintings that we saw earlier. Uh, now, the painter that um, that, that above all we associate with neoclassicism is uh, Jacques-Louis David. The last name looks like David, but it's correctly pronounced David. Uh, he lived between 1748 and 1825, that's 77 years. A long life, um, an eventful career, and he had a uh, significant impact on later generations of artists. Uh, he began as a, oh, somewhat modified, um, moderated Rococo painter, but he experienced an artistic conversion upon seeing the art of antiquity for the first time uh, during the period of study in Rome. And he said that um, this experience was like having his eyes operated on for cataracts, which removed the veils uh, that had inhibited his inhibited his seeing and understanding of the classical style. And so a radical transformation takes place in his art. And in 18, uh, excuse me, 1784, 85, he completed this work. Uh, this is really the first great masterpiece in the, in the classical style. Uh, it, it's called The Oath of the Herati, a big painting. It is almost 11 feet in height and 14 feet in width. Um, uh, David had already been to Rome a time or two, but in, um, in undertaking this painting, he returned to Rome to, to paint it there in the ambiance and in the setting of uh, the ancient past. The narrative comes from the, uh, the, the early history, and probably the legendary history of Rome. And it involves an episode where Rome was in a state of conflict with the neighboring city of Alba. And rather than uh, all the young men of Rome and all those of Alba going to the battlefield and there being great loss of life, it was decided that the, these triplet brothers, the Heratii, would fight on behalf of Rome. And there were triplets uh, within the Alba community, their last name was Curatii, they would fight on behalf of, of Alba. And whichever set of brothers won, that would decide the fate of, uh, of this, 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 this conflict between the cities. The families, the Harati in Rome and the Karati in Alba, were um, 
were further linked by marriage, uh, which complicates the story even more. Uh, this this uh, painting was, was um, the outcome of a commission from the monarchy, uh, but David changed the subject and he's invented a moment that um, does not occur in any of the accounts of, um, of this, this uh, historical event or legendary event. Uh, uh, additionally, this had been the subject of a play in the 17th century by Racine and um, Moliere or Racine, I forget which. Uh, and that play was, it was seen in, uh, in Paris at the time. So people would have, put, would have been familiar with the story. What David shows is not battle, uh, not argument, but rather a moment of oath taking where the father of the Huaji holds swords in the air and um, the, the, the three Huaji sons then vow to uh, take these swords to defend Rome even if it means uh, their own loss of life. So it's a serious moment of commitment. And you'll notice that uh, this, this moment, it, um, it leads to, to uh, two different responses. The men committed, uh, strong looking, uh, their, their hands are reaching up to, to uh, grasp the swords eventually. And the women of the family who correctly perceive that this commitment will lead to loss of life and sadness and, and despair. Um, they are shown in mournful descending poses in strong contrast to the upright, uh, geometric, the straight line poses of the men. Um, much like the painting by Angelica Kaufman, uh, David shows this, uh, this activity in, a, in an architectural setting of the greatest simplicity. We seem to be in the courtyard of the family home with an arcade seen in the distance. And you'll notice that the three arched openings of the arcade frame the figural participants in front with the, the triplets uh, framed by the leftmost arch, the father in the center, and the women on the right hand side. Um, and there's just really no, no decoration, nothing to soften, uh, nothing to ornament the space whatsoever. It's a it's a gray um, uh, perspectival box. And I say perspectival because you can see orthogonals in the uh, uh, courses of, of stonework, the side walls there and over here, and most especially in the floor. And if we follow these diagonal lines, the orthogonals upward, they will lead us to the handles of the swords. The vanishing point is right about there. Uh, the coloring is. Um, tends toward uh, monochromaticism, a dullness, a dull browns and grays. We can see this in the, in the clothing of women and the men, except for the red accents, which appear most strongly in the garment, the cape that, that covers the shoulders, drapes from the shoulders of the father, and uh, there are bits of red in the brothers. Well, no doubt the color is meant here symbolically. Red is the color of, uh, of passion, uh, of, of, uh, also of blood and death. Um, and so the father and the brothers are linked together in this moment of oath taking and commitment, a passionate commitment to the welfare of Rome by the, uh, the color that adorns their bodies. More about the pose as you can see that um, uh, there are straight lines that run through the bodies of these idealized male figures. The, uh, the, the four leg here the foremost brother aligns with the, the spear that he holds. And, uh, and likewise, the line of the father's body aligns more or less with the swords. So we've got upward reaching lines, diagonal forms, in contrast to the slumping, soft, curvilinear forms, the downward gazes of the women. Now notice there is one boy over here whose, um, whose mother or, or perhaps a governess tries to protect him and to shield him from um, this the, the, the serious undertaking and all that means of the of the males in the family but he peeks out he sees what's going on and this suggests that as a man or as a boy and a future man that um, it will be moments of this kind and uh, 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 urgent demands on his 
his, his actions that will be expected of him. Uh, the painting caused a sensation when it was completed and displayed in David's studio in Rome, and it caused uh, a sensation as well uh, when it was uh, returned to Paris and put on view there. Uh, this really marked a, a new epoch in the, um, in the practice of art, and it was seen as much almost from the outset. Now, in the years that followed, um, by, by 1789, of course, we had the French Revolution erupting in France. And um, David was very much involved in revolutionary activities. Uh, he's one of the most politically engaged artists in the history of art. Uh, he was a member of the Jacobin Party, whose leader was Robespierre. And um, the Jacobins came to power. It was, it was the Jacobins who set up the guillotine in the in what would be later called the Place de la Concorde. It was the J Jacobins that sent, sentenced the king and the queen to the guillotine. And David, in fact, as a member of the Committee for Public Safety, his name is on the death warrant for their, um, their executions. Uh, as the most prominent artist in France at the time and, and, and deeply involved in politics, David effectively became the artist of the revolution. He was called upon to design uniforms for the, the new Republican guards. Um, he was called upon to, um, uh, to design, to, to create festivals celebrating the ideals of the French Revolution. Um, one of these was the festival of the Supreme Being, um, that, that identity replacing God and the the functions of the Catholic Church during the revolutionary period. David was also caused, called upon at times to commemorate the, the, uh, the victims or the martyrs of the revolution. And this is one painting that does that. It's called The Death of Marat. Uh, I don't have a date here, Andy. Let's see here. 1793 is the date. Uh, a smaller painting, about five by four feet in size. Um, well, notice that the, the, the clarity, the simplicity, the austerity of the, uh, of the Oath of the Rati is very much in evidence here. Uh, Marat had been a, um, a, a, um, uh, a writer, a, a engaged political figure uh, who criticized the monarchy uh, and um, but had contracted a skin disease from hiding out in the sewers of Paris. Um, and um, a member of the opposing party, whose name was um, uh, Charlotte Corday, succeeded in getting admittance to his private quarters, where he would spend hours in a cooling bath in order to uh, to to provide at least a, a partial temporary re remedy to the, um, the inflammation of his skin, the sores, the, uh, um, the, the painful condition that he endured over a period of time. Uh, well, getting into his private quarters, um, appealing to his sympathy is what she did uh, um, to, to um, help her with her own problems. She pulled a knife out of her clothing and plunged it into his chest, and there, there he died. Um, David came upon the scene. David was called to witness the scene, made some drawings, um, and this is what he produced shortly after. Uh, you'll notice that the painting has a, a geometric structure um, with the simple wooden writing crate that Marat used as a desk, um, along with the, the bathtub which here looks more like a sarcophagus, um, a, a, a big, heavy, substantial form made up of rectangles and, and verticals in the drapery that hangs from it. Uh, with the, the writing crate, uh, crate then, we have a, um, a kind of grid. Um, and out of that grid, Marat's body falls on a diagonal. Uh, he stands apart then from the, 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 the gridded setting in which he's located. 
he's holding the letter from Charlotte Corday and uh, the knife that she stabs him in the chest with, you can see the wound right here, is lying on the floor. Uh, so there's plentiful evidence here of what happened. Um, the, as I said, the tub looks very much like a sarcophagus, uh, a sarcophagus being a stone coffin, usually ornamented with inscriptions or relief sculpture. So it, it has a kind of noble, substantial, honorific character. And you'll notice that the writing crate here looks more like a tombstone um, with the inscription Tumara David. And then there are a number of versions of this, but I, I guess we can see at the very bottom, the words La De, the year two. So the dating refers to the new calendar that was put in place with the year one being the year when France got a constitution. Um, most of the painting is dark and, and, and empty. Uh, the whole upper half of the painting is empty. And it seems to bear down on Marat uh, with a kind of oppressive force and emphasize the lightness of his body. Um, his, the position of his arm recalls Michelangelo's Pietà and the way uh, Christ's arm hangs down toward the ground uh, and from the lap of Mary. The wrap around his head suggests a halo. Uh, so Marat is, is depicted in, in here in a way that gives us, to some extent, documentary evidence of his execution, but also suggests um, uh, a kind of uh, superhuman or sanctified identity for him. Um, the emptiness in the upper part of the painting might also suggest uh, the, 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 the feelings of sorrow and despair and in emptiness, emotional emptiness that his followers felt with his passing. Uh, the political situation in France was highly unstable, highly volatile, and um, you may know that this is when Napoleon comes to power, first as a member of a directory. He was one of three uh, leaders that, um, uh, that was responsible for direction of the French government, and then he takes over alone. Um, David uh, went to prison when the Jacobins fell from power. Robespierre went to the guillotine and lost his life, and David came pretty close to lose, losing his life as well, uh, but promised that he would, uh, that it was all Robespierre's fault and that David would, would follow no man again, trust no man. Uh, that promise kind of fell by the wayside when Napoleon came to power. David was very impressed with Napoleon's leadership abilities, and he sought uh, artistic patronage from him. The, the work that we're seeing on the screen is Napoleon crossing the St. Bernard Pass. Again, I seem not to have a date handy. Uh, this should date from about uh, 1801. Um, it's a work that depicts uh, Napoleon leading um, a, a, a French army across the Alps into Italy um, and does so in a way that um, really pulls out all the stops to glorify Napoleon as a great courageous leader. Uh, one that um, it stands out significantly in history. Uh, now, the, the painting is, 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 is somewhat of a hybrid in that it certainly draws on the tradition of equestrian portraiture. And I want to show you a couple examples. So here on the right hand side, you should recall Donatello's equestrian monument of Gatta Melata, the 15th century condottieri, leader of the mercenary army in Italy. Uh, Donatello had drawn on the model of the ancient Roman equestrian monument in creating this work. And here is then one other example. Uh, this is a painting by Anthony Van Dyck, who painted many works which glorify aristocrats and especially monarchs. And I'll pull up the title here. This is a portrait of Thomas de Carignan, the Prince of Savoie. Uh, it, it's it's rather strange in some of the elements it includes because you'll see, of course, the figure is on a horseback, the horse is rearing, and, and this shows him 
in control of a, um, of a potentially um, uh, volatile, um, difficult animal to manage. But in addition, the painting includes a, uh, a column, a substantial column that suggests a palatial environment. And we've also got a cloth of honor that hangs down behind the prince. So uh, uh, Van Dyck re really loaded this up with um, the attributes of glorification. Well, in addition to being an equestrian portrait, David's painting is also a history painting because uh, we see we see an event happening. We see uh, we see other members of the French army crossing the Alps uh, under Napoleon's leadership. Uh, but Napoleon really stands out significantly here. Uh, he's clearly the main figure. Uh, the members of the army sh are shown in the distance. They're shown much smaller in size. So th they're there as a kind of a reference to what's going on, but their diminutive stature makes Napoleon look all the grander. He and his horse fill the painting from top to bottom, side to side. The horse is rearing. Um, it's said that Napoleon crossed the Alps on a donkey, uh, and yet David shows him on this uh, in the words of Napoleon, fiery steed, Napoleon said, you were right to depict me on a fiery steed, which Napoleon seems to control with little effort, with one hand, while he points upward and onward uh, in a way that suggests visionary leadership. Uh, and here we have a gray painting. You know, the grayness suggests storms, coolness, uh, atmospheric and geographic difficulty. Uh, and yet, there is the one red accent like we saw in the Oath of Marathi, which uh, is given to Napoleon's cape, blown around the side of him, setting off his head and the horses as well. And then a final item here of propaganda appears in the names on the rocks below. And you'll see that those names include Carolus Manius, and that's Latin for Charlemagne, the great uh, Frankish king. Uh, crowned Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800, who led armies across the Alps into Italy. And also Hannibal over here, who was the Carthaginian general. I think it was the third century BC when he led Carthaginian troops over the Alps into Italy. And then above all of them, the name Bonaparte. Uh, this is the last work I'm gonna show you by David. And this is in your textbook, but you'll, you'll have to flip ahead to the next chapter. And you notice there that the Napoleonic era is discussed. And uh, this painting is included, which is the coronation of Napoleon is the way it is um, labeled. That's not quite accurate. Um, and this is by, by David again. It dates from uh, 1505 to, excuse me, 1805 to 1808. Now, uh, David received a commission for four big, and I mean gigantic, uh, paintings which would celebrate historical moments in the, um, uh, during the, the reign of Napoleon. Only two images were completed, and, uh, and this is the one that is most frequently discussed. Um, the work is enormous in size, as I said, uh, 20 feet by 32 feet. And, um, what it records is um, the coronation of Napoleon and his wife as emperor and empress. Uh, but specifically, the moment depicted is the coronation of Josephine. Napoleon has already crowned himself. He did it himself. The crown was not put on his head by anybody else. Uh, and now that having been done, that, that, that was somewhat controversial. Uh, so David has depicted uh, Josephine being crowned by Napoleon. Now you'll notice that if you think back to the Oda Verati and the austerity, the, the economy of that painting, um, the bareness of it, this painting is really quite lush, full of uh, elaborate costumes and uh, lots of decorative detail. It would seem that David's model here is not um, examples of classicism from the past of the more spare type, but rather a work like you see on the right hand side um, uh, this is uh, by Rubens, it's from the Marie de Medici series, and in this example we see Henry IV receiving the portrait of Marie de Medici. 
uh, and you notice that this painting is similarly full of, um, of, of objects, um, clouds, every bit of the painting full of something to see with bold red accents that draw our attention to uh, most especially Jupiter, the king of the gods, in the heavens looking down on the king of France, Henry IV, the two figures linked together by their colors. Uh, David's painting similarly has strong red accents that draw our attention to uh, particularly the figures of Napoleon and Josephine in the center. Uh, the event took place in Notre Dame Cathedral, but you'll notice that um, the setting does not look Gothic in style. By this time, Notre Dame had been classicized, had been kind of brought up to date because the Gothic style had fallen out of fashion. So rather than the pointed arches, we have round arches and we have uh, pilaster-like forms that, that support the arches. Um, the painting would seem to be uh, and it, um, it, it, it comes across as, as a kind of document on the one hand that shows a plethora of figures, giving a, a clarity of who is there and how they were positioned. Uh, but in fact, these figures were altered in order to include people who weren't there, but, but whom Napoleon wanted to be have in the painting, most especially his mother, who is seen right here. She has a prominent location in a box in an elevated location uh, with a small retina of figures around her that appear like attendants. She looks down um, with pride at her son, uh, but in fact, she was not present. And then it's a little hard to see, but up here is in, in the shadowy upper box is David himself, and he has a drawing book in front of him. Uh, depicted in a way that suggests that he was present and that he made sketches that uh, to give a kind of documentary accuracy to this painting. Uh, this is the Pope, another prominent figure seated here. Uh, the Pope was brought from Rome to be present with the idea that he would, his presence would give legitimacy to this event, but rather than be crowned by the Pope, which, which would suggest that the Pope was, uh, uh, was higher in authority and could, could, if he wished, take the crown away, uh, Napoleon took the crown from the Pope's hands and crowned himself. So the Pope sits here sort of passively, um, impotently watching as Napoleon um, uh, goes about the coronation of Josephine. And Napoleon, though a short man, notice is shown standing, uh, and the other figures are, are lower in height, in part because some of them are standing on a lower level. And this gives him a physical prominence that he did not actually have. So the thing is really very carefully made, very carefully thought out, and uh, right down to, to every figure that's included and in, in, in where they're located. I want to talk about one other uh, painting that exemplifies the um, neoclassical style. And this is the work of um, Jean-Baptiste Dominique Ang. And this is in your textbook in that following chapter uh, on page 680, a work that dates from 1827. Now, David was so prominent as a, uh, as a leader of the artistic community, or is also prominent as a political leader. Um, is um, that um, his paintings were so successful that, uh, that young ambitious artists flocked to him as a teacher in great number. And it's said that he taught really a couple generations of, of artists, uh, literally hundreds of artists who rose to the top of the artistic world in the decades to come. And the one that ultimately had the greatest influence over a long period of time was this painter, Jean-Baptiste Dominique Ang. Ang lived a long life. He died in um, 1867 uh, at 87 years of age. By the way, uh, back to David, when uh, Napoleon fell from power and the, um, the monarchy was restored in 1815, uh, David, uh, whose name was on the death warrants for the king and queen of France back in the 1790s, well, David was in trouble. 
and he was forced to go into exile. He left France and he spent the last 10 years of his life from 1815 to 1825 in Brussels um, in exile from, uh, from France. He did communicate with French artists, however, and had at least some influence on, um, on the, the, the practice and administration of art in the years uh, of, of his exile. Uh, but dying in 1825, then Ang would live for another almost 50 years, and, um, and he emerged as the, um, the leader of the neoclassical school through the middle of the 19th century. So this is a painting of his, which is entitled The Apotheosis of Homer. And this is a big work. It is uh, 12 and a half feet, roughly, by 17 feet. It was made as a ceiling painting, um, but not painted be soto in su, that is, as if the contents were seen from below, but rather in a quadro riportato fashion, as if it was a painting that had been relocated on the ceiling above, and we looked at it there, um, where we see the figures um, in, in a straight-on way, as if we're standing on the same ground as, as they are. Uh, the painting dates from 1827, as I may have said earlier, and um, like um, like so many works of David, it looks back to the ancient past for its subject matter. Now, at this time, there was a great interest in the origins of, of Western civilization and classical culture. And Homer, the Greek poet of the ninth century BC, was seen as the great founding figure, the great father figure of Western civilization. And so what we're seeing here is his apotheosis, but also his influence, his progeny, as it were, in later generations of Greek, French, even English artists through time. Um, that's Homer, the blind poet in the very center, who rises above the whole crowd of figures except for the winged victory who crowns him here with a laurel wreath. He's set off by a, uh, a, a classical temple in the background with ionic columns, as you can see, ionic capitals. And um, uh, this is his name. In, in Greek letters. Um, surrounding him, symmetrically, uh, in the first rank of figures are ancient Greeks um, who were leaders of their respective, um, uh, their, their respective art. This is, for example, Phidias the sculptor who holds out a, a mallet and a chisel. Apelles, the painter, is over here. Uh, we've got, this is, I believe, Aristotle. Um, Apelles holds a palette and brushes you can see here, and um, we've got a musician, and I forget his name, holding a, um, uh, a stringed instrument, a lyre. Uh, as you work outward, then, you find uh, members of later generations, later centuries, even later millennia in Western uh, history. So, for example, uh, Apelles holds the hand of Raphael. This is Raphael right here. Um, this is Virgil, the, uh, the Roman Latin poet, who has his arm over Dante. And um, it was Virgil who is, who is Dante's guide in the Divine Comedy. He leads him in that long epic poem through the realms of the Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Shakespeare appears down below. This is Poussin. Uh, Moliere and Racine are over on this side. Um, Ang thought long and hard about who were the great figures in uh, Western civilization. And, uh, and so chose to include some and leave out others. Apparently he, he, he thought about including Mozart and did not, and he made a mistake in that regard. Um, I, I've talked about many of the figures except for these two. And these are uh, not historical figures, but rather personifications. They stand for Homer's two great epic poems the Iliad and the Odyssey. And um, you really should be able to figure out which one is which from the clothing that they wear and by the objects positioned next to them. them. So this is uh, the personification of the Odyssey, the journey of Odysseus 
through the Mediterranean and the various trials that he endures. And you notice that there is a, a, a paddle here that suggests a journey by sea. Um, the red garment of the personification of the Iliad, which is the story of the battle between the Greeks and the Trojans, her garment suggests bloodshed, battle, and there is a knife next to her. Um, now, I'd be, let me see if I have it here. No, I don't. You, you should all recall, you should be able to imagine, of the works that we've studied, the work from the past that the, the, the entire composition is based on. And it shouldn't surprise you to hear that that is the School of Athens by Raphael. So just as in the School of Athens, um, Plato and Aristotle are seen in the very center, surrounded by figures who represent um, their influence and uh, similar philosophical um, uh, attachments. Um, so here we see Homer in the center, surrounded by figures that represent later accomplishments in the classical tradition in Western civilization through time. And you'll notice that Aang uses color. The figures are generally idealized. Notice they're strong, uh, masculine, well-proportioned bodies. Um, and um, Aang uses color to clarify what might, what might seem um, a crowded, confused composition. Uh, color has a structural role here. Uh, an expressive role in places, a symbolic role with the figures of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, but over here, you'll notice that adjacent figures are given different colors, contrasting colors, and this clearly separates one figure from another, and likewise over here. So this is a work then that follows uh, in, the, um, in the history of the classical style in France by a student of David, later a great master in his own right, uh, bring the neoclassical style well into the 19th century. We're going to look at some examples of architecture now. I want to begin by this building. Um, we're looking here at, at the church in Paris, and this is called today La Madeleine. But it was built uh, 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 with a um, you can see the name up here, um, St. Mary Magdalene, or La Madeleine. Um, it was built uh, uh, as, a, as a commission from Napoleon uh, as a temple of glory without an intended uh, Christian affiliation. With, with Napoleon's downfall and the restoration of the monarchy, it was then christened uh, as a church dedicated to, to Mary Magdalene. Um, in this case, we're looking at something that is um, very close in appearance um, to a, a, a classical temple. And I show you as an example, on the right-hand side, this is the uh, Roman temple of, uh, in Nîmes, in southern France, called the Maison Carré. Now that title is a nickname, literally it means square house, although this was not a house, nor is it was exactly square. It was a temple, uh, a rather smallish temple in comparison to La Madeleine. But you can see that it has uh, a sequence of columns, a colonnade across the front, six columns in number, supporting the tablature and the pediment. Um, it really follows all of the basic features of a Roman temple sitting on top of a high podium with a flight of steps approaching at one end. And we see much of this simply on a grander scale and more elaborately decorated in the Church of La Madeleine, which was designed by Pierre Vignon. And it dates from 1807, but not finished until 1842. Now, I want to show you a work that is less slavishly uh, indebted to ancient examples and more original. And that is, it may surprise you to learn, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, as designed by Thomas Jefferson. Um, Jefferson was a something of a Renaissance man. And by that, I mean a man who was interested in a wide array of things and a, and a gifted practitioner of many things. 
an economist, a politician, a farmer, an inventor. Um, he was an architect, um, a political theorist. Um, but he said that there were three things that he wanted to be listed on his tombstone, only three things. And those were that he had been the author of the Declaration of Independence, the author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and the founder of the University of Virginia. Uh, the university was located very near his home, which was outside Charlottesville, uh, there on a hilltop called Monticello, Little Mountain. Um, I'm looking here for a date once again. Never had them handy. Uh, 1819 to, to 1826 are the dates. Uh, now we're looking at the original center of the campus, which is now called the Lawn. And uh, Jefferson designed this as a self-contained, self-sufficient academical village, are his words. Let me show you the plan, which appears here. Uh, so what he intended was a main building, which we just saw located at one end, uh, a domed rotunda, a round building, which would be attached then to 10 pavilions, one, two, three, four, five on each side. The pavilions were to be and are two story in height. Uh, on the ground floor, um, each would be, by the way, occupied by a particular professor, a single professor who would teach uh, a particular discipline within the academic curriculum. The professor would teach on the main floor and would live on the second floor. And then in between the pavilions, there uh, are one story um, wings, um, which uh, include a number of dorm rooms to be lived in, to be uh, occupied by the students. And the number of those increase as you move away from the rotunda. So you can see there are one, two, three, four rooms here, and then about six rooms and maybe eight rooms and so on as you move away from the rotunda. Uh, the, down either side is a covered walkway all the way uh, so that one can walk under cover in times of hot sun or, or rain and snow. Uh, alternately, of course, you can, you can cross the, the lawn at any place to go from pavilion to pavilion. Now behind the pavilions were, uh, were gardens attached to each of the, uh, each of the pavilions. The gardens were enclosed by serpentine walls. Jefferson discovered that the, 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 the uh, complementary curves of a serpentine wall buttressed one another. And so the wall needed to be built only one brick thick and still be quite strong because a curve in one direction was reinforced by a curve, the adjacent curve in the opposite direction and so on, all the way down the length of the wall. Uh, there were then additional uh, dorm rooms um, in the second range of buildings. Um, on the outer periphery. All right, let's go back and look at some details. Here we are then with a general view that looks down the length of the lawn. You can see the pavilions with the trees mostly bare of leaves, the pavilions at intervals, and one story uh, porch with uh, student rooms behind, student dorm rooms behind. Now, originally the end here was open, and what one saw was a view of the Appalachian Mountains, a view of the mountains in the distance. Uh, so an open view at this end and a rotunda at the near end. Let's look at the rotunda first. Um, a grand building of, oh, approximately about four stories in height. And this is based quite specifically on the building on the right-hand side, which you should recognize again as the Pantheon. Um, we've referred to the Pantheon a number of times. For example, remember that Brunelleschi studied in the Renaissance and learned things from it that he could apply in the design of Florence Cathedral. Um, the Jefferson's building, Jefferson's Rotunda, is a, uh, a half scale, half size copy of the Pantheon. The Pantheon recalls 150 feet high, uh, or excuse me, 142 and a half feet high, and open all the way to the dome. Um, so it's a building that's much bigger than the Rotunda of the University of Virginia. Um, going by these measurements, then this is about 75 feet in height. Now this is divided into about three floors. Um, so 
so it is not open. And uh, I suppose there was no need for it to be that. It had to, uh, to um, house a variety of functions. There are meeting rooms. Uh, the library was located there. Another major difference is that it is made of materials which were available to Jefferson, were traditionally used uh, in Virginia, really on the edge of the frontier. And these include brick and, um, and wood for the most part, whereas the Pantheon is concrete. And you recall the inside is, uh, is given a veneer of, um, of marbles from all around the Roman Empire. The, the bases of the columns and the capitals are carved, uh, but stone carving on this scale was just simply not um, available to Jefferson. And so the stone elements are, um, are very, very limited and strategically uh, employed. Otherwise, the building is made of simple materials. And of course, it's full of windows to let light into the various rooms here, in contrast to the, um, the closed nature of the Pantheon, the only light coming either through the door or through the oculus at the top of the dome. The next slide I'm going to show you uh, shows us the different pavilions. And you'll notice that they're all different from one another in one way or another. Um, they were, as I said, uh, used by professors who taught different disciplines. And so the differences between the pavilions was a kind of key to the users, the students here, where they had to go to, go to, to, to uh, attend a particular class. If they were all the same, I think there would be some confusion in the, the use of this complex. But because the pavilions are different, um, one can easily find the one with the arches on the ground floor or the, uh, uh, the, 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 the porch of narrower width here as opposed to the wide porches here. The orders are also different. Um, the, the variety among them is really quite impressive. Let's look at a few examples. Uh, here we can see a general view of the lawn, which shows us two pavilions with um, a one-story range of, of dorm rooms in between. And we can see that this pavilion has columns in the Tuscan order with a Doric frieze. Uh, the columns are widely spaced. The intercolumnation, that is the spaces between co the columns, is all the same. And uh, up in the pediment, uh, there is a fan light that is a semicircular window with, um, uh, with, with, with mullions that divide the window into little panes of a, uh, of a curved nature. The next pavilion, in contrast, uh, it, it is simply fronted by the, um, the one-story Tuscan columns um, that run across the, the range of, of, of dorm rooms. Um, the, uh, there is a pediment again and a fan light, but, uh, but no order of, a, of, a, of a grand scale as we see here. Uh, other examples. This is one of the pavilions closest to the rotunda. We can see the order here is not Tuscan but Ionic. And up in the frieze, there is a continuous band of decoration. All this is wood, by the way, in this case. And again, we have a fan light, but with a different design in the pediment. The intercolumnation, the spaces between the columns is all the same. Uh, on the other side, here we have, oh, by the way, we, I should say about these columns are, um, they're colossal. They extend across two floors without interruption, as are the columns here. Again, colossal columns in the Tuscan order. Uh, notice the intercolumnation here is varied. So the columns appear to be paired toward the outside with a wider space in the middle that leads toward the, the door. Uh, there's a Doric frieze, a pediment, and, um, and I think still a still different, yeah, a still different pattern. Well, uh, they're, they're rather similar in the, the fan light within the pediment. Another example, here we have columns in the uh, Corinthian order. And uh, in this case, they're, the, the term for these are in antis, that is they're drawn back in between projecting walls. And you can see that there are 
engage columns on either end with a couple of freestanding columns in the middle, crossed over by the one-story Tuscan colonnade. And here another example where uh, we've got uh, arches that would rest on piers on the ground floor, piers that make a strong contrast with a colonnade on either side, and then on the second floor is a colonnade again, and this appears to be a Tuscan order with the door trees above. And here's a, a, a view of what one would see walking under the cover of the porch fronted by Tuscan columns. Again, one has the option of walking under cover when the weather uh, requires that. Uh, you can go all the way around the colonnade under cover. Alternatively, if you have to get somewhere quickly or uh, the weather's good, you can, you can diagonalize, diag walk diagonally across the lawn to get to a pavilion another pavilion more directly. We go back to a general view. So uh, Jefferson, I think, has accomplished a number of things here in a very expressive, but also functionally, um, uh, functionally efficient and um, uh, functionally accomplished work. Um, on the one hand, um, the, uh, the difference in the orders, as we've seen, the difference in the pavilions, serves as a kind of a guide to use of the place. So that one can, um, uh, one can, can learn very quickly and recognize easily where you have to go to get to a particular class, to a particular destination. Um, another level of meaning is that this is a kind of handbook of classical architecture. Uh, if we take all the different possibilities that we've seen, uh, variations of intercolumnation, the different orders, um, the um, different kinds of pediments, the, um, uh, the different ways of, of decorating the pavilion boxes, along with the rotunda, we have a kind of handbook of classical architecture. One can learn a great deal about architecture. I should say also that Jefferson chose this style because for him it had meaningful uh, um, and valuable associations. It linked um, the new American Republic with the, the, the birth of, of, of democratic governmental ideals in the history of Greece and the practice of those ideals in Republican Rome. Um, the, it was the Greeks also that uh, were the, the, um, the originators of the, the humanistic curriculum of study. The disciplines of history and poetry and, and natural philosophy and so on that were also taught here. Um, the, the architecture expresses the university and diversity of the hum, humanistic curriculum in that uh, the different pavilions with their differences suggest the, 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 the distinctness of different intellectual disciplines. In fact, they're all in a classical style suggest the unity of those disciplines and, and, the, and the way they, they overlap with and um, uh, complete one another. Uh, and finally, one might say that we have here a kind of expression of, uh, of, of nature and culture. Culture symbolized by the, the grand form of the rotunda at one end with its basis on the Pantheon. Um, it embodies um, the, the, um, the greatest uh, artistic and cultural accomplishments of Western civilization. But the other end of the colonnade is open. And this suggests that knowledge is open-ended, that uh, there are new things to explore. Um, there's a world out there to learn about and to, um, to understand more fully. Um, the rotunda refers to the past. The open end refers to the future and the, the growth of the country, the direction of the country will move in. Uh, lands to be settled and explored and learned about more fully. Uh, because of the artistic uh, sophistication of this complex and its, its uh, multiple levels of meaning, uh, this was designated by the American Institute of Architects at the time of the American Bicentennial in 1976 as the greatest work of architecture in this country, the most important work of architecture of all of this country.
All right, so that brings neoclassicism to uh, the American soil. Uh, the first work we've, uh, the first American work we look, looked at in this course, there'll, there'll be many more to come. Um, and well, that will stop for today.